They say it's the most important election in history. It's coming up on Tuesday, and we're going to be talking all about what it means today on the FeeCast. Hello and welcome to a very special Friday before the election FeeCast. My name is Richard Lawrence, and we are here today with a Fairly reduced panel, but I think our conversation should be just as lively and informative as ever. We have Dan Sanchez and Marianne March. Wow. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. So we are sitting here three, four days before the midterm elections on Tuesday. And of course, it's hard to avoid hearing about it, uh, despite whatever bubbles we're in. Um, and we keep hearing that it's the most important election Ever. Well, it tends to pop bubbles. It's like even um, apps will just like remind you to vote, like just random apps like Spotify, like apps that are not even political. Yeah. Like like one Spotify ad says, oh, these are songs that are popular in this um, this state where people are polling mm-hmm. at, at this time. Just like is so forced and it's so like. The the get out the vote uh, propaganda is just really strong right now. It's an interesting advertising scheme because that's essentially what Spotify is doing is they're trying to get people on their platform and they're using this hot moment of the elections. It's so important that everybody is talking about it, even including your favorite apps and advertisers. Our former uh, panelist, Brittany Hunter, who still writes for Mm Fee.org, actually posted on Facebook. Hey, Brittany. (laughs) Something about another app reminding her to vote. And it was just, it may have been Spotify for as as long as I know. I I was actually lifting it straight from Brittany without giving credit. (laughs) Sorry, (laughs) Britt. And so it seems like every year, every election, but every year now, because everything's political Mm -hmm. year round, things are getting more contentious, right? I mean, I don't think it's any secret that we've all had arguments probably with our family and friends to one degree or another, online, offline. And I'm just sort of wondering what that's doing to either civil discourse or sort of the culture at large. It's really hard to have conversations. And I think it's important to note that this is a this is a big election just because it's a big election. All members of uh, the House of Representatives, those seats are up for grabs, 435 spots. Right. And then another 35 um, Senate seats are up for grabs as well, in addition to some more local elections. But... It's tough. I even just discussing current events with friends gets gets bad fast, and it's you you got to be a brave soul to to wade in there. I well, think. What, what's that game? Uh, six degrees from Kevin Bacon or seven degrees? Yeah. Six degrees of separation. separation. Yes. And I I think that's the way topics are. It's like everything is like six degrees from Trump, or even mm-hmm. fewer. It's just like everything, every subject of conversation can somehow take a Trump turn. Uh, it's 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 a minefield. You just can't get away from it. Yeah. It's funny. There are a few different bubbles that I inhabit, right? So I've got my <clears throat> sort of economic liberty and personal liberty bubble that we are you know exploring here at Fee all the time. I've got my Apple bubble because I'm a huge Apple fan. We were yeah. talking about the new laptops earlier this morning. Yeah. Uh, I've got my Star Trek bubble because I'm a huge Trekkie. If people out there didn't know that, this is something <laughs> I can go about for hours and can hours. Can you do the hands? I can, but I can only really do it with my right hand. Ah. My left hand is incompetent at doing the <laughs> live long and prosper Vulcan salute. But with all these bubbles that I inhabit, I've got music bubbles too, you know, because I play music. There, there. It's a funny thing because political conversations happen within them as well, right? And it's impossible to ignore. And we were looking, you and uh, I, or no, you and me, uh, Marianne, were looking at a uh, Apple website mm-hmm. the other uh, day, and we were looking at sort of how they disclaim the way in which they sort of block political conversations. It's not allowed if you have 100 or fewer posts within on, their forum, right? On their forum, right? Yeah. You have to have 100 or more posts in order to weigh in on anything from net neutrality to uh, there's a new story on uh, students working on assembly lines for Apple in China. Hmm. We're, we're sort of developing new rules for the way in which politics has permeated everything. Yeah, even on a site like Apple. That's interesting. I didn't even know that they discuss politics at all on their sites. Well, it's not Apple itself. It's a news site related to Apple oh, News. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and tech tech news sites there's just tons of politics in there like any kind of cultural site uh it's just it's pervasive and so you know whenever people say to me this is the most important election in history i kind of have a moment of like oh, why are they saying that to me right or mm-hmm. what's their agenda because now is what's most important to us richard we don't care about a year ago two years ago well, now it's true in that sense every election 
if you're concerned about that being the way to change the world for the better, Mm -hmm. right, is the most important election ever. I mean, because it's the only one that's going to affect things going forward. And so in a very Mm -hmm. literal sense, it is the most important election in history because it's the Mm -hmm. only one that we have anything to say about today. Yeah. On the other hand, everybody has their own agenda they're trying to push. And so you kind of always have to ask, you know, why are they telling me this? You know, what do they want me to do? You know, these get out the vote campaigns Mm -hmm. you see everywhere online. Are they aiming for a particular candidate? Most cases they are, Mm -hmm. in fact, doing that. And so it's just kind of interesting in in every area where we're sort of getting this message. Politics is the only way to influence change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, recently at a rally in Las Vegas for Nevada Democrats, uh, former President Obama had this to say, not voting this November would be profoundly dangerous to our country, to our democracy. So when you have peop- somebody that is well-respected, like President Obama, saying that it, it's do or die almost, then that's really motivating to a lot of people, or at least we think it's motivating. We'll see what actually happens at the, at the polls, because uh, traditionally, midterm elections don't produce that high of a turnout. For the past 100 years or so, it's been roughly 40%, and the highest voter turnout for a midterm election was in 1966. That was only 48.7%. So even uh, just under half of eligible Mm -hmm. voters are coming out for these midterm elections. They're saying, though, that this turnout should rival the last presidential election. Yeah, we'll see. see. I mean, for the last 100 years, it's been about 40, so even 50 would be be record-breaking. Enormous, yeah. (laughs) Well, and it's very coded because when it may sound like it's just sort of like a civil service announcement, Mm -hmm. just in general, get out to vote because you need to participate in our democracy, whoever you're supporting. But because it's coming from Obama, Mm -hmm. it's like it's implicit that, you know, he's he's saying get out to vote against Trump, uh, against the Republicans in this midterm election so that we can, um, you know, take congressional power b- back mm-hmm. and um, and weaken Trump and then hopefully lead to a, le- uh, a momentum to unseat Trump later. And the same thing with like these the, um, Hol- Hollywood get out to vote. Right. Because everybody, it's also implicit that it's like, okay, well, it's a Hollywood actor. No, nobody's expecting them to, to, to be uh, unbiased about this question. Yeah. I, it would probably be a little dangerous to make a prediction, but I'm going to make one anyways, which Go is for it, <laughs> essentially four years ago during, um, or excuse me, not four years ago, but during Obama's uh, midterm, first it was the Democrats controlling the House and the Senate, and then the midterm election came and boop, not, not so, not so fast Democrats. Right. And I think that's what we're going to see again here is that the Republicans control the House, control the Senate. There's a strong push right now for Democrats to go out to vote. They want to flip it. And I wouldn't be surprised to see it, but uh, I think that just adds to the interest and the contentiousness as people really feel like we're taking back whatever, we're taking back it all, I guess. Hey, you know, they <laughs> say the pendulum swings for a reason, right? And so yeah. people become dissatisfied with the outputs of a certain kind of government situation with mm-hmm. certain representatives or executives. And then they say, we want something new. And so they end up going to something else. But this time the dis- dissatisfaction isn't all about government itself it isn't so much all about the policy as it is about the personality yeah. i think yeah. i mean there's just something about trump that uh elicits such a visceral hatred uh mm-hmm. among among his opponents that like you, you you didn't even see with bush uh or or republicans b- before that i'm going to ask you guys a kind of two part question and this is a little cold because we haven't talked about this before but i think you guys will have some pretty interesting opinions on it why is everything political today? And it's been trending that way for the past few election seasons and cycles. So it's not, I don't think, particularly on Trump. Um, but what, more importantly, I think, what is the harm of making everything political? I think that the role of government in the economy and in our lives has been growing in a lot of ways. And so really that raises the stakes. Right. Because because then you really it's it's a matter of like who is able to persecute whom and you you want to be the who and not the whom and um and so it, you really want to like influence which party gets into into power so that that can be the case wait a second is it really about persecution because that's a pretty strong word 
Um, in, in people's minds, yeah. P- I mean, people, sort of retaliation? Pe- people feel persecuted and they don't want to be persecuted. And they, they want to take what is rightfully theirs. Um, and so they never think that they are persecuting other people. But, um, you know, in a lot of ways, they are. Like if, if, if it's about, you know, taxing the rich so that you can get free college, you know, uh, as um, if, if you believe if you believe in property rights, then then that that is persecution. Yeah. I, or yes. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to, if if we may, uh, go back to the first part of your question, Richard, about why yeah. why this is happening now, and I think I want to conjecture that partly it's because politics is everywhere right now. It's in silly sitcoms on TV. It's in our advertisements. I think especially it's in because- Twix bars. This yes. Halloween, you've got left or right Twix bars with yep. red or blue. Mm-hmm. So I think that because it's just everywhere in the things that we're consuming, it's getting inside of our brains, whether we're active participants in watching news or not, it's um, these kinds of tribalist things are getting into our heads and it's being expressed. So even friends I have who who don't like the news, who don't follow current events, they still will pick up on things and it comes out in conversations. Right. Right. So to address the first part, and then I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? What's the deleterious or the bad effect of making everything mm-hmm. political? Um, just a lack of enjoyment in life, I think, because <laughs> it's we're not discussing the great things that happen. Why would we? But, um, there's not a problem to be solved. So I think that our discourse naturally leans towards the problems and... I, sometimes I just want to sit back and enjoy life. Yeah. It is really good. <laughs> I read a headline the other day that said, if you end up not reading the news, you are a lot happier because you realize living in this country is actually not so bad as it's portrayed on the news. Yeah. I mean, the, there's talk about people having, um, you know, real psychological damage yeah. from from the, the election, actual like post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and people, even, even when it doesn't get that bad, it really preoccupies people it it really like it's a a good part of their day is wringing their hands about politics and i do want to say for a moment i think it's important to affirm that when people express ptsd symptoms or otherwise are truly upset about the election that's a real feeling and so that's a consequence Mm -hmm. of making everything political too and so i wouldn't want to diminish that people are actually feeling that way because we know that they are and you know we want perception is reality it is absolutely and so we want to we want to help them out and i think one of the ways to potentially help them is to continue to change the culture back in a way that not everything is so contentious and political where I win, you lose, or vice versa, right? Yeah. And so mm-hmm. I want to take a moment here because we all win when we go back <laughs> to fee.org forward slash shows because that's where our content from all the fee casts and various other shows that we have going here at fee uh, are located. And in fact, we are also, this very fee cast, your weekly dose of economic thinking is also located in audio-only form on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and on Google Play. And so everyone should check that out because we're not only a bunch of talking heads here on video on Facebook or YouTube, but we're also for your enjoyment in the car or when you're on a run. Um, So now I want to kind of delve a little bit more deeply into, again, some of the bad effects of making everything political. And we've seen this in the news recently with tragedies, uh, one in in Pittsburgh, of course, at the... uh, Tree of Life Synagogue, where 11 people were killed uh, by a gunman expressing anti-Semitic views. Another uh, act of potential political violence, it was actual violence, was the failed mail bombs Mm -hmm. to various uh, people of influence, primarily in the Democrat Party, but also in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk a a little bit about sort of, (laughs) it almost seems, and I think it's fairly mainstream to say, these acts of violence are being perpetrated right now because the election is coming right up. It's almost as if, again, probably mainstream to say, they wanted to influence the elections by these acts of violence, which are horrendous and and terrible and tragic. And I'm wondering what the connection that you see is between the fact we have the most politicized culture ever in this country, everything is about the election coming up on, on Tuesday, and we also have these terrible acts of violence that in American history are not very common when it comes to electoral politics. Well, yeah. So the, the mail bomb perpetrator that he sent the mail bombs to cer- certain people that Trump had vocally criticized, 
uh, and to CNN, uh, who Trump criticizes a lot. And so you might think that he was motivated for that reason. And whether or not he actually thought that he could influence things that by like threatening these people that he's going to silence them and that's going to hurt Trump, like it might not even be that as practical as that. It, it, it might be the, to the extent that like, oh, they, you know, he is my tribal leader and they are, you know, insulting my, my tribal leader and I'm going to, to defend them. And, and of course, someone like that is, is mentally imbalanced right. and, and is, is um, suffering from, uh, you know, a break from reality in, in a lot of ways. Um, but but that that is basically the the, the thinking that because po- politics does make things very tribal, very very visceral, and very uh, uh, anti the other. Right, mm-hmm. it yeah. sets you up against other people, yeah. mm-hmm. and nobody likes to lose, especially if we've established well, I'm on this team, and the other team looks like they're doing good. I'm hearing that mm-hmm. they're going to get this kind of turnout on election day. It's it's scary for people to think that they're not going to win. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the stakes being really high and every year more so than the last year. And when it gets that serious, people do take it, take it to heart. Mm -hmm. And then with the, uh, with the synagogue shooting, um, I, the, 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 there was, I, I saw, I read some things about the shooter maybe thinking that, uh, basically being motivated by anti-Semitism because um, uh, George Soros, who who is Jewish, was like funding the caravan, which is the caravan of immigrants, which is like an invasion of of the country. And so, so again, there's just these conspiracy theories and and this this mm-hmm. uh, animosity, this this tribal animosity and and hatred that 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 politics uh, stirs up can lead to um, extremism. Yeah. And then when those extremists pop up, people, I think, just reactionarily try to squash them down because it's ugly. We don't want that in our society. But that has the unfortunate effect of just making those people feel like they are the ones who are being repressed. It's true. That me and my and my views are not palatable to the rest of the world and they're silencing me. And so I don't want to speculate on on the psyche of these people, Um, but it seems like that would not be helpful, especially when you have... um, a person who's maybe already prone to violence. I think a lot of the conversations that are happening with a very political feeling in our current national dialogue um, are reflected also in pop culture, right? And so I've always been a big fan of sort of uh, these shows that show post-apocalyptic or alternate histories because it's always just so interesting to look at. And one of them is The Handmaid's Tale. I Mm -hmm. read the book in high school or middle school, and, you know, of course that's a hit show that – I think we've talked yes. about in the past here, and uh, that's obviously reflecting a lot of political concerns, legitimate concerns that people have. Another show I in, really enjoy watching, and I'm about to buy the book because I can't wait to actually see how it ends up, is The Man in the High Castle, which is on Amazon, mm-hmm. and it's by Philip K. Dick. It's all about an alternate history in which the Germans and the Japanese actually won World War II, and they ended up taking up taking over the world and carving up the United States. The Japanese have the West Coast. There's a mm-hmm. neutral zone, and then there's the uh, greater Nazi Reich that, that controls most of the continent. Continental United States. And so the reason I bring this up is because when when you see things like that, I think it's very fictional. This is a very fictional uh, world in which uh, Jewish people no longer exist for all intents and purposes. Mm-hmm. Various people who are religious, because of course the Nazi regime was very anti-religious, uh, they don't exist anymore. All sorts of other people that were persecuted by that regime for being different or not within the bounds of their ideology, they're all gone. And it's enjoyable to watch something that's fictional. Mm-hmm. And then this thing in Pittsburgh happens. And then you wonder, you know, to what degree is this actually the world that is not fictional, you know? It, anything can happen. Are you saying we're in a simulation? <laughs> we're all holograms. <laughs> anyway, it just sort of all brings to, to mind that nothing is ever totally stable. Mm-hmm. There, are, there are things that can happen that can change the course of events. Again, the reason that people say this is the most important election in history is because it's the only forward-looking one, right? It's not the one that's ha- – it hasn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but it makes me feel sad, again, that – 
you know, we, we still have to have these conversations, and it is a fact of life. We need to have these conversations that, that different people uh, exist in the world, and that it's important for us to have tolerance, mm-hmm. to understand difference, to continue to breed cultural exchange. Yeah. And uh, I guess that's the, the task that we have at hand, but uh, well, it's think, kind of hard to remember that sometimes. I think it's also important to remember to even be tolerant in the face of intolerance. Because as Marianne uh, raised, a lot of people are using political violence as an excuse to restrict speech. Right. And, and mm-hmm. a lot of time Nazis do come up in that regard because they, they say, well, that's the ultimate exception. Like there, there's a whole meme of, of punching a Nazi that like uh, that Nazis are, are such represent such evil that if just from expressing their beliefs that 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 gives you a right to to punch them and and so then but then once you accept that and then it just becomes a question of who do you classify as a Nazi and um, and a lot of people can have a very expansive definition of what constitutes anyone a Nazi. I don't like right anyone I want to punch uh, anyone who I want to silence with with the force of government mm-hmm. and what a great excuse oh that was harmful nobody can hear this that's you know, this harkens back to some really disturbing things from our historical memory. And I don't know, it's the the visceral reaction of wanting to punch somebody. We have to overrule that with our rational brains. Mm-hmm. It's not acceptable to say that somebody said something ugly to me and I lose all control. That's not how it works in a civil society. No. Yeah. We're all responsible for our reactions. And restricting speech is a Nazi means. So taking a Nazi means to silence Nazis, it's like, well, what if those, what, what if that power ends up in the wrong hands? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the hands of your worst enemy, in fact. Exactly. And mm-hmm. so how do we sort of move past this coming Tuesday? So we're going to have an election, right? It's going to be the most important in history. It's going to set up the government for the next couple of years at least, and it's going to set up our conversation for all of 2019. So what sort of ways can we as individuals help to reduce the amount of political violence, also the amount of vitriol between people of maybe different views uh, Mm -hmm. online or in person. What are the steps we can take going forward? I think commerce. I I think um, reaching out and starting a business, um, creating uh, jobs, um, selling things, uh, reaching out. I mean, I just think that, you know, if you take a a break from looking at the news and, and look out your window, you'll realize that uh, amidst all all this political um, uh, angst, that that there's that basically we are living in harmony. That that every every day people are are exchanging goods and services, are helping each other out. A lot of times, people who are politically uh, opposed to each other, um, as long as the, the 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 six degrees from Trump, you know, doesn't doesn't get get crossed, and um, and so sometimes that does happen, and, and so even even in in restaurants, you'll you, 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 we've seen videos that go viral on Facebook of of people having altercations, right. and, and so it even even bleeds into that. But but um, the, the the more that we can engage in in private enterprise and um, and in um, engage with each other as as human beings and a, 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 as opposed to enemy tribes then um, the more we can diffuse this. I think a lot of people would say that's a very nice theory, Dan, (laughs) but tell me how it works in practice. What Mm -hmm. would you say to people who say, you know, commerce, uh, you know, we we do it all the time. We don't really think about it. How is that a solution to a situation in which the stakes are so Mm -hmm. high on the political side. Well, I think it reminds you to value the other person. And regardless of which side you're on, if you're the person who is doing the service for a customer or a client, then that person is giving you money, which helps you helps you live, buy groceries and put gas in your car. And then on the other side, being the, re- the receiver of services and goods, that doesn't just come out of nowhere. Somebody has to be there and deliver that to you. Mm-hmm. And by living in a society instead of all just being one man islands, we have much better lives and we live longer. So enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Longer and wealthier lives. It's true. I'm just kind of thinking back to the conversations I might have with people who have Mm -hmm. possibly different political views than I and thinking, you know, that seems like uh, for us a no brainer answer, but most people don't Mm -hmm. recognize the power 
that trade and commerce have Mm -hmm. in our own lives to make each other less alien, right? Mm -hmm. And to actually foster voluntary interaction, which is the exact opposite of what happens when you go into a voting booth and you vote either for or against something that the majority are essentially going to tell the people in the minority what to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess in addition to um, showing our appreciation to each other through commerce, I think I would just suggest for people to find something to do. (laughs) And I don't mean to be flippant about that, but I think that when you're able to focus on something and be passionate about something that's constructive, that you live a much happier life and the politics maybe doesn't matter as much because you have something else to fight for instead of just hoping that your vote will do something. Sorry, yeah. I've been called a cynic when it comes to politics, well, believe it or not. Well, a lot of it is good good thinking for us to really consider here. So we're going to get past this. It's all going to make sense in whatever result that happens, right? I think the bottom line, though, from our perspective here at FEE is, you know, be sensitive and notice the interactions that we have that are not political mm-hmm. and maybe focus on expanding those on growing your interest in not telling people which way to vote one way or the other, but actually appreciating this wonderful, wealthy uh, society in which we Mm -hmm. live and noticing, I think again, that it's not just come out of nowhere. It comes out of a situation that we have uh, where people are permitted to trade peaceably, Mm -hmm. where they have the benefit of the fruits of their labor, where people can associate and speak freely with each other on their preferences, on their terms. Um, Those are the cornerstone ideas that got us to a situation where we are today so wealthy that we're able to take a lot of time and a lot of money to argue about it amongst (laughs) each other. So it's kind of one of those things that, you know, the chicken or the egg, right? I mean, did politics create this great society? No, Mm -hmm. it didn't. This was created by free people interacting with each other on their own terms. Yeah, I think if TK were here, uh, TK Coleman, who was on the last episode, he, he would say to remember th- uh, that you are the, the principal agent of change in your own life. Yes. And to, to not look at figures like Trump as either someone that you can outsource your agency to yes. or as an excuse to not have agency uh, as as some, someone who's preventing you from from empowering, uh, growing in your own life. Take your own responsibility for mm-hmm. your own life. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to have to leave it here. Mm-hmm. So whatever happens next Tuesday, I'm sure we'll be talking about it. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, have a great weekend. Find us on Google Play. Find us on Apple Podcasts. And find us also on Spotify because we're there and ready to be listened to if you'll have us. So have a great weekend, everybody. We'll talk to you next time on the FeeCast. 